particularly difficult one for theologians, for homilists, for biblical specialists. It's very difficult because it's, it's hard to understand exactly what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples. If you only take the story of the, of the steward or the or manager, it goes back and forth in such a way that even the biblical commentaries that are used to prepare sermons recommend four to five ways to preach on them. And most of them say, pick one piece of the whole story and preach on that. Because it is so twisted and entwined that if you try to preach on the whole story, you're not going to be able to. So many preachers today are going to avoid preaching on this reading. If you were at any other church, you probably won't hear anybody who make a reference to this morning's gospel. But there's another reason why people normally don't want to preach on it because it touches on something very delicate, money. And most of the time, we don't want to talk about money. We don't want to talk about having to give money, and we definitely don't want anybody telling us how to handle it. Our money. So, in other places, nobody's going to want to touch this reading. But I'm bold. <laughs> so, I'm going to go there. I'm going to talk about money. Because the reality is that the church, when I say the church, I mean the, the church, the body of Christ, has had issues with dealing with money since its start, since its beginning. We have been talking about how best to handle money in the life of the church forever and ever and will continue forever and ever into the future as well. To make it well, the church has, has resorted to a lot of many different tax, tactics. At some point, the church sold indulgences. In other words, you had to buy your way into heaven. And depending on how bad you were, the more money you had to spend to get into heaven. Now, how did the church measure how much each person had to pay? I have no idea. But the whole thing was, let's find a way to make money for the church in a way that seemed appropriate. And so, we sold the indulgences. At a certain point in the life of the church, and I still know some place where they do it today, we sold and rented pews. Depending on how much money you gave, that is how it was determined where you sat in church. So the best seats were always the ones for people who gave more money. Now if that is not a good influence, I don't know. Of course, you have a situation where, where people from the church would say, if you don't do such and such, I'm not giving any money to the church. And you know, my family has always been patrons of this church. We have done many things as a church that in many cases are very despicable to make money. And in some cases, I wonder and all of us should wonder, what was the motivation? Was it really about being church? Or was it to feel the power of having money in the bank and controlling people's lives? I know of some churches where they will tell you, if you don't give us a 10% of your gross income, you are going to hell. No ifs, ands, or buts. This is just the way it is. And to make sure that what you're giving is the correct amount, we need you to give us your pay stubs. <laughs> I'm serious if you should really actually have to turn in your pay stubs. So that the church or pastor can calculate whether or not you're giving your 10% to the church. And besides that, you have to give to the pastor's fund, to the outreach fund, to the pastor's car fund, to the women's guild, <laughs> and to the other thing, but you know, that, that is optional. But if not, you're going to hell. 
See, and Jesus is very clear. You know, we, we, can, we can go around it as much as we can, but Jesus is very clear. You cannot serve God and God. You just cannot. Because you're either going to despise one and love the other, and most of the time you're going to be faithful to one and deceive the other. You cannot do both. So it's difficult for us as people of God to, to try to determine where, what role money plays in our lives. But if we don't ask ourselves the question, what, if, what does money mean for me? Then we can easily find ourselves in a position where money has control over us instead of money being an instrument to achieve a goal. The question has to be asked, what does money mean to me? And it is a question that not only we have to ask it of ourselves as individuals, but we also have to ask it of ourselves as the body of ours. What role does money play in our lives? See, the reality is that none of us can get away from it. None of us can get away from the question of, do I want or don't want money? Because I don't, if, if you're one of them, let me know if money, if you never have money or never touch money or never have to deal with money. If, if you're like that, I want, I want to be like you. <laughs> All of us, at some point or another, have to make decisions about how we handle our finances, our wealth. Do you want money so that you can tell everybody that you have a lot of money in the bank? One of the sad things about talking to what I can now refer to as young people, you know, people who are in their 20s, um, is that if you were to ask them, what do you want to be? What is your goal in life? Sadly, too often the response is, I want to be rich. I want to be a millionaire. It's like, so, 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 why? Because if I have money, I am powerful. For what? You know, the, the sad thing is that more and more we hear this idea that we need to do whatever it takes to get a lot of money so that we can say, oh, I made my first million before I was 25. Yes or what? What does that mean? What are you going to do with it? How different does that make you? How does that make you special? And most of the time, the answer is going to be, I can buy anything I want. I can buy six cars. I can have a house with 20 rooms. I can have three swimming pools in my backyard. The question that constantly comes to these young people is, for what? What are you going to do with it? 20 bedrooms by yourself. What are you going to do with three swim pools if you don't know how to swim? What are you going to do with six or seven cars if you can only drive one at a time? What is this all for? And often, there is no answer. Now, of course, most of us here don't handle that type of currency. But the question is still the same. What role does wealth play in our lives? Is it simply a means to an end? Or is it the end in itself? Is this what